So this morning, we are starting a new series called Discipled. You know, that is something that we as believers, we should all want, we should all desire to be, to be discipled. And some people think that to be a disciple means just listening to your teacher, learning what they're teaching, when in fact, biblically, being a disciple means so much more. Being a disciple doesn't mean you just learn from your teacher and know what they know, but it means you do what they do. And so if you, were, if you say that you're a disciple of Christ, that means that you should act like him. And we've learned that through the life of Paul, because what does Paul say about, uh, what does he say to others? He says, imitate me as I imitate who? As I imitate Jesus, as I imitate Christ. And how hard is that? If you were to tell somebody that, could you tell somebody that? Imitate me because I imitate Christ. How many of us really, truly imitate Christ? I look at that and I'm like, that's tough. Because how many times do I imitate <laughs> my own desires and I don't imitate the one who I even, I, I claim to imitate. I claim to be a disciple of Christ. But how many times do I, do I fail? And we all fail from time to time. But what do we do when we do? Do we just give up? No. We get back, what it was, if you fall off the horse, you get back, what? Just forget the horse, right? Just keep walking. No, you get back on the horse and you keep going. So what does it really mean, though, to be discipled. So over the next four weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. And today, we're going to be talking about the call to discipleship. The call to discipleship. And we're going to learn about four disciples specifically and their call. And what it meant for them and what it means to us. But before we get into our passage today, which is Matthew chapter 4, before we get into that, let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just come before you this morning. and uh, Lord, this topic this morning is such an important topic, um, discipleship. Lord, we should all desire to be discipled, and we should all desire to, dis- to uh, be willing to disciple others. But Lord, that is such a challenging thing to do or even just say, because we know of our own shortcomings. We know of our own failures and and faults. Lord, I just pray that this morning, that as we uh, begin our study, our series on discipleship, Lord, what it means to be discipled, that, Lord, that we would just take an honest look at ourselves, that we would realize our own faults, and, Lord, that we would ask you to help us through them so that we would be able to glorify and honor you. Lord, I just pray that you would, again, be with us this morning. Lord, help us to stay focused on on your word, on your truth, and help us to ignore all of the distractions, Lord, that are out there that are trying to keep us from learning more about you, that are trying to keep us from being a true disciple of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, as we talk about the uh, as we talk about the call to discipleship, let's start off with Matthew chapter four, starting with verse eighteen. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he this is speaking about Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, "Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men." Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The call to discipleship. This was when Jesus was starting his ministry, and he called his first disciples. And did you notice how they obeyed that call? How did they obey? They obeyed immediately. Think about that. Obeyed immediately. 
the first two disciples, what were they doing? They were, they were fishing, right? They were working. They were at their jobs. Jesus says, hey, follow me. They immediately quit their jobs and go. If you were in that position, Jesus comes up and says, hey, follow me. Would you just walk away from your job and leave? So that's what they did. And then um, the sons of Zebedee, right, they're fixing their nets. They're, they're working with their dad. Jesus says, follow me. And what do they do? They obey immediately. They leave their dad, and they obey immediately. Not only do they obey immediately, but they obey completely. Completely. They don't just say, well, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll come, but, you know, I'm only going to go part way. I'm only going to do this. No, they did it all. Because being disciple, being a disciple, there's sacrifice to that. And there's a cost to discipleship. The cost to discipleship. Let me share with you, some of you know, but maybe not all of you do, the, the cost that I've paid for discipleship, the cost that I paid for following God. Most of you know I was raised in Nevada. I went to school, I went to college out in California, and I lived there for about a year after I, I graduated college, and then I went to Missouri to do further training, which I wasn't sure I needed, but come to find out I really did need it. And while I was there, guess who else was there in Missouri? Naomi, right? My now wife. Well, we started dating and spending time together, but when school ended, I went back out west, and she went back east to, to Pennsylvania. And we continued the, our relationship, and I would fly back once a month. And I didn't have a, a high-paying job at that time, and it was too expensive for me, for me to, to fly every month. So I decided to pack up my car and take 80, I-80, all the way across country to move there. Now, was that a sacrifice? It was. I left my family. I left my friends. I left everything I knew to move to Allentown, the Allentown area. Completely different. When just driving there, I got honked at so many times. Because in that area, if the light turns green and you're not going within a half second, you get honked at. Like, you move. And you just drive differently and, and congested. I remember our first house that we bought, it was a twin. And trying to describe that to my family out west. It's like two houses that are together and they share a wall. They said to me, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you want it? Well, that's just how they do it out here. And, and so it was different. Yes, it was a sacrifice. But was it worth it? Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was worth it. So I lived there for about 16 years. Worked in a, in a church, doing, doing great things, what I thought, you know, for the Lord. And then God called me to here. Now, was moving here a sacrifice? Yes. <laughs> Who said no? <laughs> yes, it was. Why? Because, again, we left family. We left friends. We left what I was familiar with. We had a nice house. We had a nice neighborhood. The guy across the street was into cars. Oh, man, it was great. We, could, we helped each other out. We were a light in that community. It was great. We had to leave all of that to come here. Sacrifice. Following God. But 
Was it worth it? Yes. Yes, it was worth it. So many times where we're at in life, we're comfortable where we're at. We enjoy where we're at. But God calls us to somewhere else. And we don't want to go. An illustration that's used is, is trading a bag of dirt for diamonds. So many times what we're holding on in this life, where we're at, is just a bag of dirt. But it's my dirt. It's familiar dirt. I love my dirt. But what God has for us in reality is diamonds. And unless we give up our bag of dirt we don't get to receive the blessings of having a bag of diamonds. Can you imagine having a bag of dirt going, going in to, let's just say a pawn shop. Hey, I'd like to sell you my bag of dirt. I need some money. Would they give you a whole lot for it? Probably laugh in your face, right? But if you come in with a bag of diamonds, they'd be like, yeah, okay. I can work with you on this. So many times we hold on to our bags of dirt because we're afraid of what following God might cost us. When in reality, the cost is not that much. But let's look at the cost of discipleship specifically for these men because maybe the cost of discipleship would be similar for you. The first cost of, of discipleship was vocational. If God told you to leave your job immediately, don't give a two weeks notice, get up and go, would you go? It's amazing. We know at least Peter was married. Did Peter say, well, let me go home, talk to my wife about it first? Do you know that I actually know, well, one guy specifically, who quit his job before talking to his wife about it? Women, would you be happy about that if your husband comes home and says, oh, hey, by the way, I quit my job. Would you be happy about that? Probably not. Probably not. But that's what Peter did. He just said, you know what? Yeah, I like, I like being a fisherman. I, I, I'm good at it. Being a fisherman is a, it's a necessary job because people need to eat. But they just left their vocation immediately. Would that be a sacrifice for you leaving your job? Was it, do you think it was a little bit scary for me leaving my job and, and coming here? Selling our house. What if we come here and it doesn't work out? What do you do? Sacrifice. The other thing that they sacrificed was their way of life. And God might ask you to sacrifice your way of life. Who here likes their way of life right now? It's a good life. You're out in the country. And if God asked you to forego your way of life, and I use this illustration just because it's so different for us, but to move into the city. Well, you're not just in a um, um, like a duplex, but you're in like a row home. Oh, that's even worse. Neighbors on both sides. Oh, oh man, right? Your yard is this big. It's nice to mow, though. It takes like 10 minutes. But the way of life. Has my way of life changed throughout the years? Is my way of life different than what it was in, in Nevada or California? way of life changes. Are you willing to sacrifice your way of life to follow God? These, these men were. They also sacrificed their family. How many of you love your family? Nobody loves their family? Oh, there's one. All right. <laughs> At least there's one person who loves their family. You get bonus points today. Would it be hard to move away from your parents, from mom and dad, brothers, sisters, aunt, uncle, cousins, whoever? Would, would that be difficult? Some of you have done that. There's only a handful of us here, I think, 
that don't live close to family. Some of us actually have to take a train or a plane or an automobile to get to family. Some of us can just walk to family. Sacrificing the cost of discipleship. Is the cost of discipleship a lot? It can be. Would it be hard for you to give up your job? Would it be hard for you to give up your way of life? Would it be hard for you to give up your family? I think of missionaries several years ago, 40 years ago, even maybe 30 years ago, not so much 30, but 40 years ago. When you went on a foreign, when you were a foreign missionary, how did you contact your family back home? You actually had to write a letter and send it out. And did it get there next day? Some days, weeks, or even months. And then, and then when email came, up, came about, oh man, this is great. Now you can still stay connected. You can you know, type it out, send it, and, and get a response within minutes. And now with technology, right, even though my family is across the country, I can call them anytime. I can video chat with them anytime. The only challenge is, is the time difference and trying to get that to work because that can be a challenge because when I'm available, they're not, and when they're available, I'm in bed sleeping. Challenges. The cost of discipleship. Now, your cost for following God may not be these three things. Maybe it's friends. Maybe it's just material possessions. What are material possessions? Is it really, in reality, is it diamonds or is it dirt? It's dirt. When you go, when you leave this world, how much of this material possessions that you love, that you enjoy, can you take with you? None. And what happens with the rest? Either people fight over it or they can't get rid of it quick enough. They throw it away. The cost of discipleship. But guess what? The cost is not the only thing that we're going to be talking about today, because it's not just the cost of discipleship. There's also rewards for discipleship. That's what we need to be focusing on. Not the bag of dirt, but the bag of diamonds that we're going to get as we get rid of this bag of dirt. The rewards of discipleship. Let me, let me read here in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says this. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What do you get for being a disciple of Christ? You get a transformed life. What does that transformed life look like? It's a life of hope. It's a life of, of promise. That there is something better out there for you than what you have here. When Jesus, when Jesus called these disciples, what did he say? He's like, you're no longer going to be fishermen, but you are going to be fishers of men. Instead of bringing fish up out of the water, out of the sea, they're saving the souls of people. What's more important? Fish or souls? Souls are so much more important. And when we look at that, it's like, man, what a great thing that, that they did. They were giving up, we, we look at that, that, those first verses, and man, they gave up everything. Do you think those disciples regretted giving up family, their time with, time with family, friends, their job, their way of life? And ultimately, those disciples, they sacrificed with their lives. 
didn't they? We try, strive so hard to hold on to this life here on earth sometimes, don't we? When what we have beyond our our life here, is it diamonds or dirt? We're made of dirt. When When God made Adam, what did he use? He used dirt. So if somebody calls you a pile of dirt, yeah, well, you kind of are. You can't really argue with that. I am dirt. When I die and this body has no longer life in it, it's going to go to dirt. That's, that's what it is. But a transformed life, not only that, not only do we get a, a transformed life, but we get an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. An intimate relationship. Think about that. Where is Jesus when you need him? Where is Jesus when you need him? With you, right there, wherever you are. If you need him in Pennsylvania, he's there. If you need him in Nevada, he's there. If you need him when you're 35,000 feet in the air, traveling over 800 miles an hour, is Jesus there? Yes. Yes. He is. It doesn't matter where you go. He's there. Intimate relationship. That's amazing, isn't it? That is simply amazing. And who is this? Who is this Jesus? John 14, 6 says what? Does anybody know that verse? I am am the way, truth, and the life. Right? No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, that's right. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. You get to have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Some people complain because they don't have an intimate relationship with Christ. Does that happen by chance? If you're, if you're married... Do you have an intimate relationship with your spouse? If you do, does that just happen by chance or does it take work? It takes work. And not just easy work, it's hard work, right? Is it harder for them or for you? The answer is them. Okay, the answer is always them. Because if you, if you say it's you, then you're definitely the one that's more difficult. But yeah, an intimate relationship. What do you do as a disciple? Are you a disciple? What do you do to increase that, that intimate relationship? Do you spend time in God's word on a daily basis? If you don't, Should you complain about not feeling close to the Lord? No, because you're not trying to get close to him. He's still there. As a believer, he's still there with you, for you. But you've got to put forth some of the effort. These these disciples that were called, when Jesus called them, they could have said, yeah, we'll follow you. I'm just going to stay here and follow you. Is that what being a disciple is all about? No. No. A disciple is about sacrifice. Sacrifice hurts. Sacrifice is scary. But you know what? If you sacrifice for God, are the rewards worth it? Yes, they are. I talked about my illustration. I sacrificed. I did. How many of you would like to leave your home growing up? How many of you would like to leave your family, your friends behind to go to a new place where you don't know people? And the people you have met, you don't know, are a little off maybe from time to time. That's sacrifice. But guess what? Is it worth it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So as we continue on this series of discipleship, 
I hope and pray that, that you would be encouraged to not only be determined to be a disciple, a genuine disciple of God, but that you would even maybe be challenged to disciple somebody else. Does that intimidate anybody here, discipling somebody else? It's challenging because, oh, what if I mess up? Do you think those in my life who have discipled me were perfect? No, they were not. None of them were. How about those people who discipled you? Were they perfect? No, none of them were. So why do we think that we need to be perfect in order to disciple others? Because don't we think that sometimes? That I'm not good enough? You're right, you're not. But follow Christ so that others can follow you. So what do you think it would have been like, must have been like for those disciples? What if you were at work and some guy comes along and says, hey, follow me. Give up what you have, give up what you're familiar with and follow me. How would you have responded? Let's pray.